Christmas, the merchant says, well, I really like to sell you, but as you see, I don't have it. You say, well, have you tried it? Oh, yes, I put in orders for all kinds of turtleneck sweaters, all sizes, all colors, all styles. I've got a lot of orders in for turtleneck sweaters, but as you can see, they're not here. And you have none in your warehouse? He says, oh, I never, I never checked the warehouse. You don't do an inventory? He says, no, hardly ever. I'm too busy putting in orders to ever check to see if anything's come in. Well, then how do you know that you haven't received anything that you've ordered? See, we're constantly putting orders into God. How rarely we do an inventory? Gratitude is how we know that God has answered our prayers. And I want to tell you that the man, the woman who never practices gratitude in a serious way, and I mean not just for funkery money, muttering, so thank you, Jesus, for the nice day, but genuine meditation on your blessings. And Lord, I noticed this in my life today, this specific thing, and I am so grateful. If you have never practiced specific gratitude, you ever receive an answer? The, the reflection, the backward glance that measures progress is missing, and as a consequence, you don't even know what to ask for any longer. The person who, does, who doesn't practice gratitude tend, ends up like a grumbling child talking to God about whatever seems to be bothering him at the moment. So that's the second point. Gratitude is how to see. God's answers to our prayers. It's how we take inventory of the things that we have, have asked God for, have actually been received that God has answered. Lesson number three. Gratitude actually has power beyond just the inventory of answers. Gratitude is the way we see God's hand in our life. Gratitude is how we see God at work in our life. When I read you William Law's line about gratitude a few minutes ago, I didn't finish it, and I want you to hear the end of it. When you know who is the greatest saint in the world, it's not he who prays most or fasts most, it is not he who gives most alms or is more eminent for temperance, chastity, or justice, but it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God will. This is the line I want you to notice who receives everything as an instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. To receive everything that happens in our lives as an instance of God's goodness. This is hard for us to do. You, you, you may be like me sometimes and say, I'm a realist. I don't look at the world through rose-colored glasses. I can see things as they really are. But I have come to understand as a Christian our pessimistic, realistic view is not how things really are. There is, in fact, a God working behind the scenes of our lives, is there not? And if there is a God working behind the scenes in our lives, then we have to believe that the things that have happened to us, even if they don't seem like blessings, are ultimately blessings. We may not be able to see them as blessings until we get to that other shore and look back. But they are blessings because God is guiding us through our lives. Gratitude is the way we see God working behind the scenes of our lives. That's how things really are. Behind the scenes, someone is interceding for us. Amen. Gratitude is how we trace God's hand through our lives. Of course, we never always see God's involved with that clearly. And some of life's events that we don't have to have. Let's be honest. As a believer, I, uh, I have wished that everything in my life would turn out to be perfect and passive. We've had tragedies in our family. All of you have had tragedies and difficulties and trials and problems. Sure. Some of life's events simply don't have a happy ending. As a believer, I have to trust that if God doesn't work it out now, God will work it out eventually. Shh. It's quiet down, man. Even if I have to wait until heaven. See, gratitude is, is different than any other thing, any other discipline in Christian life, because gratitude plants our flag on heaven's shore. When you practice gratitude, you are expressing the assurance 
that even though things don't look like they're working out right now, that in the end, when you can look back from the heavenly shore, you are going to see that all things have worked together for good to those who love God and they follow Him. Do you believe that? This is lesson number four. This one may be a little surprising. Gratitude creates optimism and courage. Gratitude creates optimism and courage. Think about that. Most people see this the other way around. They say, well, if I'm optimistic, I'll be grateful. If I'm strong and confident, I'll be grateful. If I feel good and everything is working out for me, then I can go to God and say, oh, I'm really thankful for all of this. It's just the opposite. Cowards cannot be grateful in hard times. Cowards are only grateful when they're getting what they want. But the more they whine and beg, the less courageous they become. You courageously stand up and say, okay, this situation is bad. I know it. But I also know that I have a lot to be, a lot to be grateful for. Suddenly you're taking an optimistic, courageous assessment of your life, you see. And because you're taking an optimistic, courageous assessment of your life, optimistic, courageous feelings will follow. And so will optimistic and courageous actions. Any great person who shows courage, who shows optimism, had to be grateful for his recovery life. Jesus had in many ways a tragic life. He was born in poverty, conceived many thought out of that life. His family became refugees when they do return to their own land after a long time in a foreign land. They settled in an unpromising village of Nazareth. There, Jesus does not even get to do anything of significance for nearly 30 years. He works as a carpenter until he's nearly 30 years old. And so when he finally does come out and take up the mantle of leadership, he spends the last three of years of his life being opposed and threatened, and he is executed and martyred by the age of 33. They explain to me that, why was Jesus always so great? Even at the very moment when he is feeling the cold hand of death coming down on him, he knows that his enemies are preparing to take his life. Even at that moment, he takes the food in his hand and says, Father, thank you. I'm grateful for what you're doing. How does he do that? It's because in the midst of tragedy, Jesus viewed the ultimate goal of the Christian life, the Christian life of optimism. And I know he didn't always feel optimistic. We have times when we see Jesus getting discouraged, but still, he thanks God. Jesus acts as if the universe were in good hands, even though he himself faces imminent tragedy. Hear that sentence. Jesus acts as though the universe is in good hands, even though he himself is about to be marked. Here's a little poem. We come to lessons instead of philosophy. Count your gains instead of your losses. Count your joys instead of your woes. Count your thrills instead of your woes. Count your smiles instead of your tears. Count your courage instead of your fears. Count your full years instead of your lean. Count your kind years instead of your mean. Count your health instead of your wealth. And hard labor. Amen. That makes us focus on the good and we probably focus on the bad. Makes us focus on the blessings more than our disappointments. Helps us focus on possibilities. It helps us see the actions that we could take rather than focusing our failure and our weakness. You see why this is a missing ingredient in, in the lives of a lot of people? Is it the missing ingredient in your life? And then it would be, if it is, I would change. I wish that you would, this afternoon, sit down and bring God into your heart. Open your heart in prayer. And there start thanking God intentionally, deliberately, and specifically. For all that God has done. The little town of Enterprise, Alabama is a rather odd monument. It is dedicated to, of all crazy things you can imagine, 
Mexican bowl 